Hello, this is about writing a PhD proposal. Now, a PhD proposal may not be required in every PhD program out there. So first of all, it's very important for you to check the program requirements and make sure that you meet them. For example, in the US, I had to write an extensive PhD proposal for my research, and this would have had to have been approved by my thesis committee. Whereas here in Germany, you basically just write a one pager with a time schedule, and that is um, approved by the thesis committee, but it is a much more informal process and much less detailed than it was the case in the US. Now, without wanting to diminish the importance of this PhD proposal, we'll talk about that later here, um, it should also be appreciated that very rarely will you really be exactly doing what you write in this proposal, because simply this is often not the way research works. It is not this linear process typically that you now already lay out what you're gonna do for the next three or four years and clean work packages and then you're just gonna simply check all the boxes and go through the various steps you have outlined in your proposal. In my case, I ended up doing virtually or almost none of the things that I proposed and I went through numerous reiterations of a research proposal until I arrived at one that I myself and also my PhD supervisor were happy with. Uh, but in the end, I still didn't end up doing almost none of the stuff that I proposed. This is the way it can go. It's fine. Now, here is the reason this is fine. The reason is writing this proposal does a couple of things. The first and foremost, most important thing to consider here is that it forces you to really thoroughly go through the literature in your field and get sort of a, a very solid overview of the lay of the land, so to speak, and to get to know the major characters in your field in the literature and the key seminal papers. And it just basically arrange them in a way that makes sense for you to have like a framework for your research. That is invaluable, even if what you end up doing is going to be slightly or even entirely different, that way, that work will simply not have been wasted because that'll help you so much to put everything you do in context. Now, part of that is, of course, finding the literature in the first place, but then also critically evaluating that literature. That is also a super important exercise. And a part of that exercise is finding your gap or finding several gaps in the literature that your PhD research is intending to fill, could fill, or will end up filling. But this is already just an important exercise in dealing with the literature, even if you're ending up with a slightly different project in the end, you still went through these moves. You found the literature, you critically evaluated the literature, you put them in a coherent framework, and you use that framework to identify some key gaps. This, in the end, nobody can take away from you. This is a major achievement for your PhD, and it's also difficult to do. And let's talk about how to do that now. First of all, the literature review. The most important message here is never rely on somebody else's literature review. Otherwise, you will probably regret it. So the most important thing is that you do your own solid literature review. You spend a fair amount of time on that. You make sure you don't miss anything because nothing, speaking from experience, nothing is more irritating than discovering that at the end of your project or a particular experiment, somebody had already done that before. You should realize though that making a good literature review is hard work. It's not easy. <laughs> It requires a lot of effort. You need to first come up with a useful set of search terms. You need to continuously refine these search terms. You need to read these papers, understand them, but also critically evaluate them. You know, what did these particular papers not do well? Can I rely on this information and all this? This takes quite a bit of work and effort. It takes also help from your supervisor and your peers. But I think this is, this is essential, <laughs> basically, to make sure that your PhD work is based on a solid uh, evidence base. So many of you may have been hired on a grant where somebody already did a literature review for you because this is the grant proposal that ended up fund, being funded and then in the end provided the money to hire you. 
So of course you can get access typically to this grant proposal and the literature listed in there is of course going to be a great starting point. But again, do not rely on that. Make sure you double check that there isn't some important body of literature that, hasn't, that has been missed just because of the search terms that have been used or whatever. So I think that is basically on you. It's part of that um, road towards a, a PhD and your establishment as an independent researcher. And this does take a lot of effort. This literature review is going to be a central part of your uh, PhD proposal. And as a matter of fact, the literature review is always going to be a central part of any proposal. Because if that literature review basically fails to be comprehensive, then what comes afterwards is also going to be called into question. So this takes a lot of practice and effort, but it is really worthwhile to do that very well in the beginning. So make sure you budget in the time to do this literature review in a solid way at the beginning of your PhD journey. The second bit of your PhD proposal that follows from the literature review is you are identifying a gap in the literature. Now this is not as straightforward as it seems because in order to identify a gap you have to have a sufficiently broad coherent and consistent framework so that you put all the pieces that are already there in that framework that allows you to see the gap in the first place. So it's easier said than done. And the gap could be of any kind of nature. It could be a methodological gap. It could be an ecosystem type gap. It could be an organism type gap. It could be a mechanistic gap, a conceptual gap, whatever is relevant for your research field, but it needs to be solidly worked out what is not there. And as I said, that is not as straightforward as it sounds. It is an, also an art form. And not only that, it is fairly trivial to say, well, this particular method has never been applied with this particular plant species in this particular soil. No, I mean, that gap needs to be a substantial gap. It needs to be an important gap for your field. That, of course, makes it more difficult because just identifying any gap, of course, would be a trivial exercise. But you need to make sure that that gap that you're identifying as part of your research proposal for a PhD is an important gap for that field. Basically, this is the part where you explain to others the value and significance of your research that you want to do for your PhD. And then, based on this gap, you will formulate your major hypotheses or your major goals, depending on the style of your program. And they need to be succinctly formulated as specific statements. Typically, at the end of this, I have identified this gap. Now, the next piece of your PhD research proposal will be essentially your work plan. So you can divide it into work packages or you can divide it into chapters depending on the style of your program. Typically, you require, let's say, in the natural science or in biology, three chapters. So it is also important to structure it in a way that the resulting product is going to have these three chapters, let's say. The most important thing about the work packages is that they basically don't appear as idiosyncratic samples of all of the possibilities that could be basically worked on in this particular field. No, they need to be, they need to have a logical relationship to each other. Basically, ideally, what you do is you can draw a diagram and say, like, this is how this work package addresses the major question. This is how the second work package does. This is how the work packages relate to each other. This is how they, for example, funnel into work package three. So that requires a lot of thinking because it is comparatively <laughs> easy to come up with basically a list of particular things to do and experiments to design or observational studies to carry out. But what is the next step after you maybe have this list of things that are possible to do and that interest you and that are important is to pick the ones that seem inevitable. Basically, this is <laughs> what you need to present to the reader of your proposal. This needs to be done and this is why and this is how these things are connected. And this is how also the entire thing will be one result, basically. This is how they all fit together to build one story. And 
that is not so easy. You need to sort of look very critically at your list of things that you want to do and you might have to toss some that really don't contribute to this overall mission because this is a dissertation. It has a theme and it has a overarching storyline that you need to feed everything into. Otherwise, it's going to be more difficult to write in the end. But that is the important thing about the work packages. Now, the differences then uh, will, will be depending on your program, like to how much depth do you have to describe all the methods and things like that, that you would have to look up the requirements. But basically, the, the general guideline is you describe in as much detail as you now can, based on your knowledge and experience, how this experiment or study would work out. What is the design is going to be most important and then what are some of the key methods. So that needs to be quite clear in your outline. So I'm using a factorial design or I'm using a regression approach with this axis and that axis and this is how I'm going to get my, how I'm going to get my samples or this is how I will set up the experiment. What type of experiment? Is it a field experiment, greenhouse experiment, lab experiment? Things like this depending on your field. That's going to be um, like the essential nuggets basically that need to be populating these work package descriptions and make sure they have a crisp statement of experimental design at the beginning of these work packages so people are immediately oriented to what this is going to be about. So two other points about the work packages. The one point is, is very, very frequently forgotten is that you get so worked up in the details of the work package description and of your beautiful designs and all that, that you then forget to mention how exactly what particular result will feed back to your hypothesis or your goal that you formulated. Like, if I get this result, it will mean that for my hypothesis. This is sometimes <laughs> forgotten, but it is an important sort of um, final part of the description of every work package to say, well, I will do this design, I will carry out this experiment, I will do these measurements, I will analyze the data statistically using these methods. But then you need to also say, if I get this result or this type of result, it will mean that for the hypothesis. So basically closing the loop, you derived your hypothesis in the beginning, you based on this hypothesis designed this experiment and now you need to close the loop and say like what exactly will a particular result mean for the hypothesis and also alternative results. And another part of the work package description, sometimes it's a separate section, will require you to put together a time schedule. Now this is important because it forces you to think about what's realistically possible in your time frame of a PhD, like three or four years, depending on your program, what can actually be done? And is this realistic? You cannot do just anything. It's not possible for one person to do um, a huge program. So this is basically the reality check that your committee or your admissions um, office will look for. It's like, is that reasonable? Does this person have like a grasp of how long things will take and are they basically budgeted in an adequate way in your time schedule. The time schedule can be relatively rough or you can use a complicated Gantt chart. Basically this is up to your program requirements but it should at least give an indication of you having thought through what is actually realistically achievable. And that's it. I think this can also be fun. You know it forces you to think very broadly about your PhD work. It can lead to epiphanies, it can lead to new interesting ideas. So basically accept this not as an irritating and annoying program re requirement, but as a chance to really think deeply about what your contribution might be for your PhD. And then finally, really don't forget to check your program re requirements. There will be differences that <laughs> are very, very big among countries and institutions. So make sure you check those and of course, be in dialogue with your advisor and also peers. And with that, good luck with finishing your PhD research proposal. Thanks for watching this video and see you next time. Bye.